the letter of the Corinthians written by Paul um, to the Corinthian church, to a portion of it that's well known, but worth hearing again and perhaps settle in as long, but it is so good. Um, it is much of the chapter. Remember that these letters are teaching these brand new churches how it is to be a church, a community together with all these different personalities and strengths, just like we have. So as we turn to the word again today, let us turn to God in prayer. God, we do ask your spirit upon us here, upon this community of faith, as we read of these gifts. Uh, help us think of our own, uh, what you have placed in our heart, given us as gifts. Help us take your word, bless it, and help it um, lead us to your will. This we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all people. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit. And he gives them to each one, just as he determines. The body is a unit. Though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one Spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one Spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, cease to be a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, cease to be a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need to be special, need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it. So that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for one another. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And in the church, God has appointed first of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, also those having gifts of healing, those able to help others, those with gifts of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But eagerly desire the greater gifts. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Last week, 
we began a journey that will take us through the summer. Remember, through this time that we call ordinary. And our track began simply and wonderfully by asking the shortest of questions. Why? I shared with you that all good things must begin with why. I believe why we do something is powered and influenced by the Holy Spirit, which guides and directs us. Why is directly tied to our belief. Why is oftentimes difficult to put into words, because why takes discernment. But in the end, it is empowering. It is convicting. So if you missed it, you'll have to check it out on YouTube, like I said last week. <laughs> Some people throughout history have been very excellent at letting why, letting their core belief guide them, and they were able to lead from their why. These have been the innovators and the leaders of people who follow. In the biblical witness, there were those convicted by why. Centrally and primarily, of course, was Jesus. Jesus' why was the why of God. And it was so big that he, to speak his why, he had to use parables. He had to use stories that made a very complex why of faith much simpler. And even then, though, tricky to understand. Jesus' why totally flip-flopped the status quo on its head. We now just cannot understand what it meant to be incarnationally present, physically present among the diseased at that time, among the impoverished, among the sinners, as they called them, and tax collectors, even among women at that time. What that meant that he was there. But you know, maybe we can. Because we still divide ourselves between those within the community and those without the community. With those like us and with those who are different. With believers and with sinners. So maybe we can understand it. Jesus' why was big and it was difficult, though, for society at that time to understand the invitation to him was made for all people. And many struggled with that. Now still today, we claim Jesus as our guide through all this. You would think why would be easy for the church. Remember, belief is our business. But sometimes, a lot of times, it's just simply not the first question that we ask before we do something. It can become easy for a church to fall into the programmatic solution of finding more kids. And hey, to attracting the young families, you know, the one with all the kids. To focus on making worship memorable and upbeat and a spectacle. Trust me, I get like 10 emails a day. Do this, try this, sign up for this, try this, try that. Attract, attract, attract people. There's programs all over. They're out there. And some are even great. But why we're doing all this in the first place must be where we start. We start with why. I believe that our why is that this church is called to be a community that has fully come to accept that it is God who has given us the gifts of grace and blessedness. We have received the gifts. All that we do as we worship, as we grow, as we serve, and as we share, is a response to the gifts God has already given us. That's why I believe we do what we do. So then, the next question is, how do we do it? Because you see, every why needs a how. So, as we respond to God by worshiping, by growing, by serving, by sharing, how is it all done? This is where God's how is marvelous 
and actually really stupefying when it all comes down to it. Because he started something in tradition many, many, many years ago that we still believe we are doing today in this church right here. And guess what? It works. God chooses amongst the vastness of his human creation people, totally broken people, people like you and people like me, but people to carry out his great how. God chose Moses to be his. He was a Hebrew orphan who was adopted by royalty and grew up in privilege until one day, remember, he saw a Hebrew being, being beaten up by an Egyptian and his why, his gut, just couldn't handle it anymore and he killed the man. He put him in the sand. His privilege, gone. God chose Moses, who went from privilege to keeping the flock in the wilderness for his dad-in-law to accomplish a very great how. He chose Moses to unite a people with the message of God to dream of something bigger than slavery. And he accomplished releasing them from captivity. That dream still lives. God chose Moses to be an instrument of how he was going to accomplish his plan. God chooses and chooses and chooses and continues to do it. Our faith, our why, is directly related to the truth. The how that we believe ever so strongly that God is the one who chooses. And sometimes even God chooses us. God chooses his people to serve. And if we really listen, he calls his people to serve specifically. Responding specifically and at our best when using those skills... God gave us. In God's creating and choosing of us, God gives us these personality strengths, you could say. These passions, these skills to counterbalance all these weaknesses we have too. And Paul calls them spiritual gifts. And there we are, back to the why. God gives gifts. God gives gifts, and like the tapestry of creation, God shares gifts in abundance by sharing this bountiful wealth among his chosen people. And it is among people. That is one reason, if you are a believer in Christ, that you must be a part of a community of faith. In order to accomplish what God has for us to do, we need each other. And I know that's hard for some of us to accept sometimes, that we need one another. But it is so true. Paul brilliantly put this truth into example of a human body. Something that we as fellow humans can understand. Different parts of the same creation, each doing their part to function and do good work. It really was brilliant what I just read. We take that, we believe it, and then we as a church, particularly as a Presbyterian church, guided by the Spirit, nominate and elect servant leaders to serve in season to become the how to help us accomplish our greater why. God chooses and chooses and chooses. And if we listen close enough, we find the answer to how we're going to do all of this. 
And the answer lies in the feet, in the hands, in the eyes, in the nose, in the mouth of the body. You, no matter what body part you are, are a part of this body and you are indispensable. You and me are how God keeps the light of hope burning in this world. And let's get something straight. The why we're here is not that you are needed for the survival of a building or for the church to keep lights on or doors open or just for one another. That's not why we are a community together. God's why is so much bigger than that. You are here with your gifts to worship, to grow, to serve, and to share our awesome God in a community with one another. That's why we're here. On this day, we ordain and we install those particularly chosen by God for this season in the life of Faithful Shepherd Presbyterian Church. <laughs> Deacons and elders come with their gifts from God. They don't come with every gift. That's not how it works. Some of us are hands, some of us are feet, some of us are ears, some of us are eyes. But God accomplishes His great how by putting us together in a community form a body. Such a powerful thought. Such a simple idea. God's wonderful and big why funneled down to you and me. Wow. Let us stand in humility. Let us stand in awe. You have been chosen to serve. Now what are we going to do? Come back next week. And I'll tell you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, we come now to the time to respond. Uh, to the word, to the good news, and we respond one way by giving the gifts we have back to God.